Good afternoon and welcome to the fall 2022 Lindemann Associates Capital Markets Webinar presented by Lindemann Associates in Real Estate Financial Modeling. This is your host, Bruce Kirsch, founder and CEO of Real Estate Financial Modeling, provider of financial analysis tools and training to the business since 2009. Today, we're pleased to have an insightful program, which will be presented by Dr. Peter Lindemann, founder of Lindemann Associates, which for those of you who do not know, is a strategic and investment analysis advisory firm. We're using GoToWebinar today, and I just want to address a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. On the audio front, uh, all of your audio is muted, meaning we cannot hear you, and that's by design, and that's going to remain the case through the webinar. If you're attending by computer, take a moment just to familiarize yourself with the control panel elements. We will be showing some slides. Um, if you'd like to download them, you can find them in the handout section. You don't need to have them up, though because we'll be showing them. And uh, today we have a special treat. We're going to be talking about uh, Peter's new book um, and um, what inspired him to get involved with a book, which Peter, you've described to me in the past that books are very painful. And so I'm curious to know what inspired you to uh, take on this pain. Um, and we're, we'll, uh, have, uh, we'll have some questions at the end, at the end as, as usual. But Peter, over to you. Yeah, no, it's nice. I wanted to talk about this a little bit before we talk about the economy and real estate. So what inspired me? My dear friend Albert Ratner is the answer. And any of you who know Albert know he is very inspiring. Um, Albert called me almost five years ago now and said he was working with Mike Royzen at Cleveland Clinic on um, a book that related to all the advances that are dramatically happening in primarily genetic research um, and how it is changing quality of life, usefulness, and how long we live vibrantly. And But there were economic implications to this, and they couldn't figure quite out how to deal with it and what I want to write with them. And I said, no, I don't want to write another book. I've written as you know, Bruce, the book we've done, The Blue Bible, Real Estate Finance and Investments. And as you know, it's a painful process. And Albert invaded me to do it and did it. And I learned tremendous amount. And I'm very proud of the outcome, which is Mike Royzen is the lead author along with Albert and with me. And it's called The Great Age Reboot um, and uh, Cracking the Code for longevity <clears throat> and so yeah and it's and i'll it's really three things <clears throat> first it's when we map the genome um we found out that there are about twenty two thousand five hundred dna cells in the human body most of which control about 1500 dna cells that is, they determine whether they're on or off. Think of rheostats with your light dimmers. So we have about 1,500 DNA switches that are, to what degree are they on or off, um, with the others controlling it. And of the 1,500 DNA cells that are determining our health, our all these things in our lives, um, we control 80% of them by our actions or by our interventions and um, you know, exercise, smoking, drinking, drugs, um, uh, uh, healthy eating, unhealthy eating, <coughs> stress, stress management, et cetera, et cetera, all go into that. And, um, and so, we have as the first part of the book the genetic research some of the genetic research is occurring as it relates to 14 medical areas they're all quite amazing um the genome is known it's being explored how to utilize it <laughs> and utilize it effectively and uh the breakthroughs are are really quite remarkable, and um, 
So the first part of the book is describing to people what some of these are, regenerating organs, reversing aging, slowing aging, um, et cetera. And then the second part is when you tell people that we're going to live longer, the first thing they say is, well, we can't afford it. And I always say to people when they tell me that, so are we going to start with you? Or are we going to start with your grandfather or father? Uh, and they go, oh, no, no, I don't mean me or I don't mean them. I mean those other people. And you go, of course we can afford it. People know that socially and economically, people are highly productive. Think of somebody like the extreme, somebody like Warren Buffett. Imagine we had said, no, we can't afford to have Warren Buffett live long um, at the age of 65. The loss to society would be enormous. And all you have to do is look at our president or members of the Supreme Court or corporations, et cetera. You know it's true. We can't afford to waste human capital. That's our greatest wealth. The whole point should be how do we create more human capital by living longer and more vibrant and healthier and, and, and generate more. And of course, that part of the book describes just how much better off society will be. And then the third part says, but these medical advances are going to take time to get to humans. Lots of it is happening in animals to varying degrees of success. Um, and over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it's going to get to humans. So you better take care of yourself. That is, be your own DNA engineer, be your own genetic engineer until these breakthroughs get there. Because it'd be a shame if you didn't take care of yourself and then these advances come, but you weren't around to fully benefit them from them. So that's really the three parts of the book. Oh, forgive me for looking at absolutely everything through the lens of real estate. But what I'm what I'm hearing is if you've got a fantastic property and you don't put CapEx into it, it's going to start to crumble. Yeah, but if you do, if you get a fantastic property and you do your CapEx religiously, it's going to last a lot longer. Well, and I'd even use your analogy, Bruce. I think it's a great one. I'd use it one step further. In the same way that you can do a gut rehab and really turn back the clock, right? Not just slow down the erosion that's happening, but if you really do a gut rehab of a piece of property, you can literally turn back the clock, right? New electrical systems, new this, so that it becomes a vibrant young building with a long life. And it's not just living that life ready to die, right? It's living it quite vibrant. And I think your analogy is exactly correct. And what we talk about is not only do you want to do normal, good maintenance of your property, of your body, in this case, in your mind, but you want to think about ways not only to slow the erosion and to offset the erosion that happens over time, but be ready for major gut rehabs that can come. I'll give you some of this stuff. It sounds truly science fiction, but it's not. So I'll give you two examples of, quote, gut rehab in terms of physical building. Um, yeah. A lot of us have a hard time controlling our diet. I, I certainly do. And I know I should eat healthier, and I know I shouldn't have as much fat on my body as I do. But try as I might, I like haagen does, right? And I know others identify with that. And um, if only there was a way to make my fat burn faster so I wouldn't get the ill health effect from eating that haagen dazs I'd live healthier. Well, they have found that in several different species, they have found that they can genetically modify the DNA settings, and in so doing, make that burn much faster. 
Well, now what we have a hard time doing for ourselves can suddenly happen, which would allow us to live healthier, probably allow us to live happier, and, and uh, certainly more useful because we're not carrying around excess weight. We're not putting stress on our heart and our, our, our arteries and so forth. And that exists. It's just a matter of can they get it to work in humans? They've got it to work in animals. And I'll give you another one, which is by changing, uh, again, a few DNA settings. Um, they have taken dogs that are essentially in the last year of their life. You know, that kind of mopey dog that doesn't get out much and so forth. And right turned it physically back into the energy of a puppy, um, but not the size of a puppy and not with the memory of the puppy. It keeps its memories and its size, but because you reboot its ability to generate cells, healthy cells, you recreate the vitality, longevity, energy, youthfulness of the dog, and it lives many more years and a couple of other species. Well, that's gut rehab. In the analogy you, I think, really brilliantly brought up, Bruce, um, and there's a whole bunch of these. Some of these advances are slowing down the aging process. Some of them are reversing the uh, impacts of aging. Some of them are truly turning back the clock. And all of these are quite exciting. One of the things that I, I found most interesting and inspiring and exciting about the book was the high level calcs that you did with respect to impact on GDP, starting with a basic example of if everybody in the U.S. worked just one more day a year, right, what's, what is the ripple effect of that in terms of multiple billions yeah. of dollars increased GDP? And then you say, well, what if everyone else worked an additional 10 years? Right. And it's, so and it's a, incredible. We've got the real numbers in the book. But here's how I, I let people get a grasp of it. And I think it works most quickly because if you get into trillions and billions, most people don't grasp that. Here's the simplest way. Imagine that these breakthroughs that come over the next 30 years allow us to live healthy, vibrant, energized, productive lives for an extra 30 years. Just assume that. I'm not saying it will happen, but let's assume that. Well, if you're going to live 30 more highly energized years, years like you got a couple of more in your 20s, a couple of more in your 30s, a couple of more in your 40s, couple of, not just that you're like, a hundred year old person today that has to hang around 30 years more. Think of it as when I was young, tires got like 6,000 miles. Today they get 100, 150,000 miles, but they're not running bald the last 100,000 miles, right? They're running vibrant. So imagine you have that analogy that 80 is the new 35 and 90 is the new 45 and 100 is the new 55, for real. And, well, if you were going to live 30 more years, you'd certainly work one more year, maybe two more years, maybe three more. And, in fact, you very likely would work 10, 15 more years, both because you would want to and, secondly, because you have to, to save enough to support yourself for the extra years. Well. Let's suppose you work 10 more years. Right now, the typical person starts work around age 22 and retire around age 65. So 43 years of work. If you work 10 more years, that is basically a 20% increase in your lifetime economic productivity, right? So it's stunning when you think about it, that everybody could easily have 20% more increase in their productivity. 
plus fewer sick days, plus, plus, plus. So then when you apply that to GDP, it's quite stunning. I'll give you another one of my favorites. We spend, the United States spends about 14% of GDP on um, lifestyle prob- medical problems. Uh, diabetes, obesity-related things, uh, high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, about 14% of GDP. If by some of these breakthroughs, uh, think about the one I was talking about, burning fat faster, but there are many others. If we could cut that number in half, right, just cut that number in half, we'd save 7% of GDP. That's like one and a half trillion dollars a year that we would save. One and a half trillion dollars. And you suddenly go, wow, if this happens, it has dramatic implications because even if we spend 500 billion on the cure, we'd still have a trillion left over for all of us to spend on whatever we want to spend it on individually and as society. And that's pretty dramatic. The other thing that began to occur to us as we did the book, and we we may have a follow-up that goes into more detail. Think about, we were talking about burning the fat faster. Um, If that happens, I want to own stock in Haagen-Dazs, less so in fitness studios. Because If I can magically, with DNA, not magically, with DNA resets, eat as much Haagen-Dazs as I want and not have the uh, negative effects of the uh, calories, then it changes the mathematics. Give you another example, though, in our world. Senior housing. People tend to move, start moving into senior housing to varying degrees at around 78. Wow, you get some of these breakthroughs. If 80 is the new 40, uh, it's going to be a long time until senior housing starts having people move into it. So you'd have the current generation, but then behind that would be a very delayed generation. You would have a lot more people working. That would be a lot more people producing. That would be a lot more people consuming more, longer. The population would grow dramatically. We estimate the population. Remember, the population is births minus deaths plus immigration. Even with births, excuse me, even with births declining, um, the decline in deaths could lead to population boom. Uh, way beyond anything is predicted. That means more homes are needed, more apartments are needed, more shopping areas are needed, more hotels are needed, because we anticipate between now and 2050, perhaps as many as 110 to 120 million more people in the U.S. compared to a census baseline projection of about 30 million. And that's because the death rate will decline from about 9.2 per thousand to 2.2 per thousand because people are living healthier and longer, et cetera. So there are all sorts of real estate and business implications of this. Yeah, this is, this is it's all very fascinating. Um, it's also it's also, I think, uh, practical highly practical. I was talking to someone the other day about, of all things, you know, life insurance. And, you know, he was telling me about, well, yeah, you know, like, this is the way I ladder the policies and so on and so forth. And I, and I said to him, I said, you know, careful that, you know, you're not worth more dead than alive, my friend. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And so, you know, from a, from a, from a marriage perspective or a relationship perspective if we're working to another 10 more years each we we have a you know a lot more uh, present value alive than we do with the uh, policy of the same size so at least we've got yeah, that going and, uh, and before we jump to the economy which i suppose we should this is fun and fascinating for me 
one of the things to remember uh, socially, if no other way, but also physically, is if you live longer, um, the mistakes you make stay with you longer. And the good decisions you make also stay with you longer. And I think that's an important kind of insight. If, if go back um, 3,000 years ago and people are dying when they're 26, uh, I made a horrible decision when I was 22, but I only have to live with the consequences for a few years. In today's world, and especially in the future world, you make a couple of really bad decisions you're going to have to live with them a long time. You choose not to study your mathematics when you're a sophomore in high school. You got to live with that decision a long time already and an even longer time. On the other hand, if you did, you get the benefits of it a lot longer. So I think that's, and by the way, so, forget the monetary part, socially. If you treat people well and you nurture friendships, and, and, and relationships, which are important, um, you have a lot more years to enjoy them. But if you are a lonely, miserable person, you're going to be lonely and miserable a lot longer. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a tremendous amount more that we could talk about here, but I, Maybe I encourage... my talk of misery. Maybe my talk of misery ought to jump us over to the economy. How about that? Sounds like a great segue. Uh, um, so let me just give a quick thumbnail, Bruce, and I'd love to get your reactions. Um, Main Street, Wall Street. Uh, and let me just stereotype both just to put an imagery in your mind. Main okay. Street, school teacher, Dubuque, Iowa lives on her earnings she's 44 years old she has a retirement account she doesn't really ever look at it um because it's for when she retires a long time from now uh she owns her home subject to a mortgage she locked in the mortgage a year ago at two percent for 30 years um that's main street right lives on their income, owns a home, and so forth. They're doing quite well. They've right. got jobs, we're adding jobs, about 300,000 a month. Unemployment is low. People filing for unemployment is low. Industrial output is up. Um, uh, job openings are plentiful. Um, the home value for Main Street is almost invariably higher than when they bought and their homes are a main source of their wealth, a visible source of their wealth. Um, uh, and they're traveling again. They're able to go to ball games again. Um, travel has returned to within a whisker of where it was in 2019. So not quite, but it's almost recovered. Um, they're pretty good in terms of their situation. Yes, they've got inflation. Um, airline, the airline and hotel rates are up. And that's because even though travel is only back to where it was in 2019, there's 10% fewer rooms available and 15% fewer seats on airplanes available. That is, it's about the shrinkage of supply hasn't come back. And that, that's true in a lot of areas. On the other hand, their wages are more or less keeping track with inflation, not perfectly, um, and, and not exactly month to month. But remember, anybody who is not keeping up with inflation is paying inflated prices to somebody else who's receiving it. So Main Street is receiving the benefits of inflation and the pain of inflation. That is, for everybody paying, there's somebody receiving. Is Main Street perfect? Of course not. They'll have a lot of problems in the education system and our politics and our this, and there's still crime, and there's no shortage of problems. 
But by and large, Main Street's okay. You say, well, what about the million people who would like to buy a home? Um, but at a higher interest rate, and that a higher interest rate exists for two reasons. One, because the rate is up. And two is because the spread over Treasury is up. Um, look, largely what people do when, but that's about a million people looking to buy over the next year. But remember, it's like 90 million, and actually more, it's like 98 million have already bought and either have no debt, or if they do, they locked it in at a low rate already. So most of the households are okay with respect to housing. A million see higher interest rate. What do they do? They pause. They wait to see if the interest rate goes down. They don't have to be in the new home until school starts, the next school year starts. And so they wait. They'll wait November. They waited October. They're, they waited September, October, November. They'll buy as long as they have the down payment. People say, yeah, but they can't afford as much home because the interest rate's up. That is true, but it's not correct. And the reason it's not correct is they will use more equity. Therefore, they won't borrow as much. Therefore, their monthly can stay the same. Obviously, if you put in enough extra equity, you could keep your payment the same, even for the same interest rate, so that you could still get the same home. By the way, the fact that short-term interest rates are up means that their parents and grandparents have income on their savings so that they're able to help their kids and grandkids out coming up with more of a down payment, which they weren't able to do at zero interest rates. So one, they can come up with more equity and kind of try to keep the payment the same, even at a higher interest rate. Two, instead of buying a brand new home, you buy a five-year-old home. Instead of buying a home with all the extras, you buy a basic house. Instead of buying a new home with new bathrooms and kitchens, you buy a home that is existing and the bathrooms and kitchens are fine, but they're not the most recent uh, style. And fine, you can buy it for 30,000 less. And you'll deal with upgrading the bathrooms and kitchens over time as you get a higher income. Or you can buy mid-block instead of corner. There's a lot of margins. So people pause when the interest rates go up. They wait to see if they go down. But they need to be there when school starts. And I'm being kind of mechanical about it. So Main Street, okay. Wall Street, Wall Street stereotype trader, lives on short-term borrowings, highly margined, um, short-term interest rates are very important for them, and they're in trouble. The Fed told them they weren't going to raise interest rates. They kind of relied on that. The Fed then dramatically changed their mind, moved the interest rates very fast, which was a very important input into their business model. Their business model got seriously shaken. It turned greed into fear, took money that existed and put it on the sidelines, dry equity uh, at private equity, sovereign money kind of sitting on the sidelines, banks kind of not lending, waiting to see where things shake out. As a result, base rates went up, but spreads went up on top of that. And that's unusual because normally when base rates go up, the spread narrows and banks lend more. So the net net of lending more at a narrower spread on a higher base rate tends to be not much change in your cost of capital. But what we're seeing now is base rate up, on top of that, 200 to 300 basis point higher spread. On top of that, like the trifecta, on top of that, we're not going to lend you very much. 
And that means you've got to substitute equity for debt, and it really is shock the cost of capital. Now, a um, couple of things. Um, one is banks aren't lending very much at this point. One of the reasons, and I'll take the poster child, it's not the only example, is banks today are much more warehouses than they are balance sheets. That is, they don't hold so much on balance sheet as to use their balance sheet to issue and then sell off, repackage, securitize, or syndicate. So take the Twitter loans, right? The Elon Musk Twitter loans. The combination of credit, what's happened to that business, and what's happened to interest rates and spreads mean that that debt is way below water. Now, the banks could sell it if they want. They could still syndicate it, but they take a big loss. Is the bank going to do that? Well, no, because they have plenty of regulatory capital. Unlike 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they have plenty of regulatory capital, so they don't have to take that medicine. And they have money. So what would you do if your year-end bonus as a bank executive was blown out of the water if you sold off that debt this year? You're going to sit on it because you'd like to get your bonus this year rather than taking the loss. Okay, that means you haven't sold it. Since you haven't sold it, you can't recycle that money in the new loan. So the market's kind of frozen that way. Ah, but what happens next year? Next year's budget at the bank, and I say this as somebody who's been on a lot of compensation committees of companies over time, next year's budget will have built into it, gee, we're going to have to take losses on our existing book. The targets for bonuses will be adjusted accordingly the taking losses on that debt. And that debt has losses because of credit, but it also has losses because the spreads widen, driving interest rates up, driving the asset values of their loans down. Once new targets are set next year that incorporate anticipated losses of selling that paper, they can sell it without endangering their bonuses. And they have enough regular quarry capital so it doesn't endanger their existence as a bank. What do you think happens then next year as those are in place? You're going to see those sold off. As they're sold off, they'll start recycling that money into new loans. As that happens and banks lend again, spreads will narrow. Interestingly, as spreads narrow, rates come down, and you know that debt that they thought they were going to take a loss on, some of it they're not going to take as big a loss on, because with the spread narrowed, the debt is worth more, and they're going to exceed their target bonuses. And they're going to have to lend because they need originations to achieve profitability. So I think what you see is a situation where that money starts recycling from banks. Spreads will start narrowing as you move into the new year because of very basic incentivizations at banks. And the only reason I focus on banks is they are the biggest single capital source. Um, you then go one step further of what should I be doing now, though, when deals look marginal, Deals look marginal because I, I can't borrow. And if I do, I borrow at unusually high spreads. By the way, it's not that the interest rate itself, the government interest rate is so high. It's not much different than it was in 2019. It's that on top of that, the spreads are abnormally high. So what should you do? And, and my answer to people is, whether you're building or whether you're buying, if it's a good product and your pro forma is marginal, use more equity now 
to get it done. If it's a good property, good project, and people say, well, if I use more equity, the return goes down. The return doesn't change on the project. It only changes on your equity. And the reason the return goes down on your equity is it's less risky as you put in more equity. And my experience says that historically, when pro formas look like they don't quite work because I have to put in a lot more equity and by the way, debt's expensive and not very available, and therefore the project looks marginal. In other words, it's not marginal because of the neighborhood, it's not marginal because of the fundamentals of the economy. It's marginal because of the capital markets. Experience says that when it looks marginal because of capital markets, use more equity, do it, and you'll find it was actually one of the great times to place money. And you can go back to 75, you can go back to 82, 83, you can go back to 91, 92, 93, you can go to 2002, you can go to 2009 and 10. When it looks like it doesn't pencil because of the capital market, not because of the neighborhood, not because it's not a good long-term design, et cetera. Um, yes, a pro forma is an investment tool, but so is understanding that there are market factors that tend to make markets work in the way that make it a great time to invest. Why is it a great time to invest? Because a whole bunch of people that do not have access to the additional equity and rely on doing it with debt will not be able to do their projects, whether that's building or buying. And that tends to make it a relatively good vintage with perfect hindsight. So my notion would be use more equity, use all equity if you have to, if you have access to it. You can true up the debt in two years, three years, five years, when spreads have normalized, fears returned, uh, fear has been defeated by greed. You see people moving in, being aggressive, and and you take advantage of people backed out at that time. The other things that we were wondering and we were discussing is you know, you have this ongoing research with respect to, you know, are interest rates a, a determinant of cap rates and, you know, where's the evidence? And you've done some great um, econometric analysis on that. Right now, I think people are curious to know, you know, is that thesis going to continue to hold true, right? Um, interest rates have gone up dramatically. And are we going to take a look back and say, well, you know what, um, maybe we weren't right or do you think that the fundamental low correlation and the fundamental disconnect is going to prevail it's a great question i obviously don't know the answer what i can answer pretty definitively is for 40 years there has not been an identifiable correlation between interest rates and cap rates and that's because the spread, the cap rate spread, is much more volatile and much more determinative than a couple of hundred basis points movement in the base rate. And therefore, that tends to dominate. Um, and that spread tends to be driven by how much money wants to do real estate. And I've always described the thought experiment. Imagine everybody who owns an apartment building in Tampa um, says, I've got to have it sold by five o'clock tonight. And money is trying to get out desperately. Uh, not only do I have to get out, I've got to have it closed tonight by five o'clock. Cap rates are going to go up no matter what interest rates are 
if that much money tries to get out. And the flip is, if you told me a trillion dollars said, I've got to be in Tampa apartments tonight by five o'clock, I don't care what interest rates are, cap rates are going to plunge, right. really plunge. And it's about the weight of money. Now, those are extreme examples. We're actually in an episode. The flow of money is really about fear and greed. How much money is there and is it fearful or is it greedy? Is it, is it optimistic or pessimistic, if you will? We're living in an episode where we have lots of money. This is not like 90, 1990 where the banks had no money. Or it's not like uh, 2000, early 2009 where they didn't have any money. And households didn't have any money. Households have $4 trillion of cash beyond anything close to normal. You could even argue they have close to $6 trillion of cash beyond normal. Businesses have between $1 and $2 trillion beyond normal. So people have money. They're just sitting on it. Private equity. You have huge dry powder. They're sitting on it because they don't want to make a mistake. Banks. Banks have large reserves. They're not quite as large as they first appear for the reason we were talking about, which as interest rates went up and spreads widened, that their reserves are not quite worth as much as they look, but they are worth uh, more than zero. And prior to, they, they've got huge reserves still. And so they have money. And therefore, What's really happened, I think, is proof of the analysis we had, which is it's not about interest rates. It's about are people lending or not lending aggressively? And we're in a period where they're not lending aggressively. And that part of that is because of the Ukraine. Part of that is oil prices. Part of that's inflation fear. Part of it is the Fed has run a very sloppy uh, transition from zero interest rates to normal interest rates. I like to point out that it's not where interest rates are going that is so stunning. It's how they're going there. It's like it's like driving uh, to the shopping center today is not in and of itself so dangerous. But if you went three times the speed limit, you ran stop signs. You went late, you ran the wrong way down a one-way street. Suddenly, the way you're getting there becomes very dangerous and could hurt the economy and do some damage. But by and large, um, there's plenty of money. And in fact, interest rates on the long end are up several hundred basis points. And it's not it's, certainly it's clear that by and large, cap rates are not up one-to-one -one remotely. Now, it's a little hard to tell because there's not a lot of transactions, but it, I still believe it's true. Um, but you also have these moments of fear winning out over greed and money sits on the sideline, and that definitely drives cap rates, and we're at another episode of that. On the topic of, is this a moment to be taking pause? We've, we're, we're getting um, questions in from the participants and just a reminder that folks can continue to send them in. Um, but we've had several people inquiring about, you know, is this, is this a moment that we should be taking pause and wait and see, or is this a moment where we should just keep flying forward? And, and what strikes me is when I started my business in 2009, um, and I was lucky enough to start to work with larger and larger clients over time. Since then, I mean, it's just literally never slowed down. And if you're doing big projects and you have big investment theses and you have these long-term uh, investment horizons, it's almost never time to just pause because yeah. you're really looking at the, the big movements and um, 
big projects take a long time and you, you can't break momentum. Yeah, so I think there's that. And I would say it's even a little more than that. Real estate is about the long term. Um, and my friend and colleague, Jeremy Siegel, has written Stocks for the Long Term. I don't know what edition he's on. It's an amazing book. I get the most recent edition. And what Jeremy finds is that if you buy stocks, that is equity claims on the economy, if you will, over the long term, you'll do quite well. Even if you bought at the peak, even if you sold at the bottom, as long as you hold it long term. And I'm oversimplifying Jeremy's results, but that's sort of is if you hold for the long term, if you admit you don't know when the top is, if you admit you don't know when the bottom is, and you just say, I want to invest, I'm in the business, then you should always be in. And sometimes you'll have been a bit toppy and sometimes you'll have gotten out a bit at the bottom, but you'll do just fine. And we did, in Lindemann Letter, we've published several times, similar research relating to different real estate, no leveraged and modestly leveraged real estate. And we found the exact same result. Not surprisingly, but we found the exact same result. Uh, the only way you really get in trouble is if you over lever. And good things happen in the long run but you weren't around to see the long run because you over levered and got squeezed out. And, and I think the reason, it's interesting, Jeremy doesn't really go into the reason. And I think the real estate shows the reason. The reason is, okay, I go in at the top. Uh, I didn't know it was the top. I, I, I went into the top, whether I was building or, or buying, I went into the top. And, and then we have a couple of down years and then supply shuts down and then demand comes back. And after about four years, my income is back to where I thought it was going to be in the fourth year. It just took a really nasty big down, big up. And then I'm back on target. And that's because supply adjusts and demand returns. And that is sort of self-correcting. And might you do a little worse if you come in at the peak? Yeah, we found very slightly you do worse if you came in at the peak. And the real point to your question, Bruce, is you don't know. You may have an opinion, but you don't know this is the top. You don't know this is the bottom. And just be in. And when debt's expensive, use more equity. And when debt's cheap, use more debt, but be in and try to be in good real estate, creating value um, kind of all the way through. Very Jeremy Siegel-like in the sense of stocks for the long run, uh, I think is the right way to proceed with real estate too. On prior calls, we have participants who are still wondering about return to office and return to office just keeps showing up in the headlines. And you've mentioned in the past that there's this likely tipping point at around, you know, 60 percent where it, it's going to really accelerate in terms of who's badging in and who's not badging in. What are your thoughts on it these days? Well, if we could get every company taken over by Elon Musk, I think people would be back to the office. Um, it has taken longer than I thought it would. It is coming back, as you know, about two percentage points a week, but that's still very slow. I think we're just over 50 percent nationally, higher in Texas and Florida, lower in the Northeast. Um, and San Francisco, every place is coming back. It'll be interesting to see as some of the tech swings from mass hiring to some mass layoffs, um, if that changes it pretty dramatically there. 
I still think people come back in because by and large, it's more productive. I'm not saying it's more productive for every person, every minute, but by and large, it's more productive. It's set up to be a productive environment rather than a distracting environment. It's set up to encourage um, interaction and, and productivity. Now this afternoon, I'm going to not go in because I'm working on Lindemann letter and that kind of concentration of writing I need without interruptions, fine, hide. But that's not typical. That's not the normal person doing that. Um, I still think people come back. If you look, England, I, I think London is back something like 89%. Uh, Paris is also around that. The major German markets are also back around 85 to 90%. The Tokyo, I think, is something around 95%. Tel Aviv in the low 90s. Uh, Mexico City, I think, is around 90%. Which is to say, in most places, people are back much more than are we. And I was asked the other day why I thought that was, and I hadn't really thought about it. Um, and then as I thought about it, I, I said, it's more about, I, I had siblings and um, uh, occasionally I had to babysit younger siblings. And you had the, you're not the boss of me uh, argument among the children. You know, you're not the boss of me. And I think we're having a, you're not the boss of me moment between employees, particularly younger employees, between employees and employers. And most employers have been very slow to say, yes, I am. For whatever reason, they've been very slow. Um, and contrast that with Tokyo. In Tokyo, every employee and every employer knows I am the boss of you in the way I'm saying. So there's not a discussion. Our society culturally, probably for the last 20 years, has been a much more, I know it's stereotypical, everybody wins a trophy, you're the best, you're in charge, you're special, you're you know the most needed ever. And so those younger workers, um, are basically saying, you're not the boss of me. And you're seeing Jamie Dimon saying, yes, I am. And Goldman Sachs saying, yes, I am. And Twitter and, and Tesla saying, yes, I am. And there are others. And it, I just think at the end of the day, I believe in both golden rules. The one golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the other golden rule is them with the gold make the rules. And I think Jamie Dimon and Elon Musk are showing or trying to implement that golden rule. And I think they'll ultimately win. Yeah, and I think that it's important to remember they're, they're not doing that to make your life miserable. They're doing it because in their minds, it's clear as day that the company is going to perform better if people are together in the same space. Making your life miserable is just an added benefit for them. Yeah, I think there's, and I think you really hit it. It's not, that's a great point. It's not like I'm trying to punish you. I'm actually trying to help you. I'm trying, I take, take what I assume Musk is trying to do at Twitter which is turn the company around, make it a much more vibrant and productive and so forth. I, I have no idea how to do that, but he wants them there because he thinks it's necessary to recreate the company. And you can't recreate the company when everybody is in their couch. Bad. And in fact, Bruce, I wrote, I think an edition or so ago in Lenneman Letter, intuitively, 
I think it's probably tech companies that need to get back more than any other company. And the reason is they have to reinvent their product, their, their, their model, if you will. They have to reinvent it like every, what, three years, two years, four years? Whereas a lot of other firms, yeah, you have to curate your business. You have to curate your model. You have to upgrade it, but you don't have to do it every couple of years. If you don't cure, if you don't upgrade your business and your business model in tech, every couple of years, you're gone. You're Blackberry, you know? Right. You're a footnote right. in history. You're Visicalc, you know, if right. you don't keep reinventing. And I know most people don't have any idea what I'm talking about when I say Visicalc, and lots don't even understand what I'm saying with Blackberry. But in tech, it moves so fast, you've got to keep reinventing. And that requires, I think, something like traditional office. And um, we're coming up to the hour here. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for this today. We, we definitely appreciate you giving us um, a peek into the book that um, you're uh, you have out now with Dr. Mike Roizen and Al Ratner. I think it's something that people are going to look back on and say, wow, that was very prescient. And um, as far as we have a tremendous number of other questions that came in, as usual, we're not going to be able to get to them all. But I do want to let Linneman Letter subscribers know that uh, there is a new feature coming um, where you should look out for an email from Linneman Letter. Um, subscribers will be able to, on an, a monthly basis, uh, send in questions to Peter, and Peter will synthesize a pre recorded uh, audio message back, similar to those uh, economic updates that you did during COVID, which I know people valued very, very highly and gave a lot of people comfort and helped people make sense of things. So, uh, Linneman Letter subscribers, keep an eye out for that, and um, we wish everyone a terrific and safe holiday season, and we will see you in the new year. Thank you, Bruce, and happy holiday to all. Thank you. Take care.